Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Seasonal Tokens Podcast, where Polar interviews people so you can do more investing and less gambling. Hello, everyone. It is Polar here, the CMO of Seasonal Tokens. Welcome on another episode of the Seasonal Tokens Podcast. Today, we have another special guest. We have Jeremy Britton, an investor, financial planner, and a crypto geek. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you for having me on the show. It's an amazing pleasure and an honor for me to have you here. And I have prepared a lot of different questions for you because you have an amazing background, but I'm sure that our listeners will find out this by themselves. So let's start with the first standard question, which is, can you introduce yourself and your background with a few words? Um, Yeah, my background, I started my first financial planning business when I was 19 years old. My parents were both school teachers, so they were employees. They got paid by the hour. The more hours they worked, the more money they made. And they'd never invested into stocks, bonds, shares. They'd never bought property, anything like that, because they didn't know that stuff. They hadn't learned that stuff. And when I was going to school, I hadn't learned any of that stuff either. It was only after I moved out of home that I started to mix with people who actually had done some of these things. I was like, this is a fascinating area for me. And obviously being raised by two school teachers, I love to learn things. I love to read books. I love to learn from other people. And I probably learned more, you know, in the six months after I I left school than in the previous 12 years of being at school, because the real world doesn't revolve around trigonometry. The real world doesn't revolve around algebra. The real world revolves around stocks and bonds and properties and business and this sort of stuff. So it was, it was quite an amazing learning experience for me. The issue, Paula, that I had was I was clever at school because my parents are school teachers, so they could actually you know, help me out and tutor me and that sort of stuff. So I thought I was a freaking genius. And when I learned about this stuff, I thought, oh, I'm going to start a business and I'm going to help other people with it. But I didn't know anything about business. And so my first business, I, w- I was bust within six months. And I thought, this is crazy because there's, there's some of my friends who dropped out of school when they were 14 or 15 because... They didn't like school. They didn't like learning, but they were very good with their hands. And some of these guys went on to start, you know, like careers owning a mechanics workshop or, or, you know, working as a cabinet maker or something like that. And I thought, I'm I'm just as clever as these guys. What's the problem? But I didn't know anything about the real world. So after my first business failed, um, I started sleeping in a garage, I started waiting tables, I had like 12 months to sort of feel sorry for myself and save up a bit of money. And then when I saw another opportunity in the market, I started a second business, but this time I hired a business coach and I had to learn a lot about business. And so that business was still going like 18 months, two years later. And then my business partner got sick and spent several months in hospital attached to a drip. And I was like, I had insurance in case, you know, the the building burned down. I had insurance in case someone stole my stock from my shop, but I didn't have the protection insurance in case, you know, my business partner got sick or in case I got sick. So it was another lesson that I learned the hard way. And, you know, then I went back and started another business and went, okay, I've I've learned, I've made a few mistakes and I keep talking to other people in business and, and asking them what's the big mistakes they made and what did they wish they'd learned. And learning from other people's mistakes is obviously much better than making the mistakes yourself. So I've gone on, I think I'm on my 13th or 14th startup now. And yeah, having an absolute ball, setting my own hours. I was working from home ever since 2005, I think. So long before COVID, um, working 20 hours a week, long before the four hour work week book came out. And um, just really enjoying life because when you're doing what you love, And when you can set your own hours and you're not concerned about working more hours to try and make more money, it really does make a big change in your life. 100% agree with you. Yeah, it seems that you have gone through a lot of bad moments in life, in business especially, but in the end, we have a happy end, which is the most important thing. But we are in a crypto podcast. So what has attracted you to Web3 World? Um, well, again, like I, I've always sort of had a passion for financial planning and out of my 13 odd startups, like six or seven of them were financial planning businesses that I'd started and, you know, I'd managed to sell off 
and I tried to retire, but I got bored when I was retired. And I ended up writing a book about financial planning and how people could actually invest themselves so they didn't have to need to go and pay a financial planner, how people could choose their own stocks. And when that book became a bestseller and people wanted me to speak on stages and people wanted me to travel around the world and give the message, and then people said, look, we've, we've learned how to do it, but we don't have time to do it because we're too busy with our family or we're too busy with our work and, and our businesses. So then I got the pressure from other people to like, oh, can you do it for us? So I started another financial planning business um, based on the principles in the book, which is basically educating people so they know how to do it themselves, but they just don't have the time. So they want someone to do it for them. And when I, I, I sold that business and spent some time meditating on the beaches in Bali and hanging out on the Sunshine Coast with, with Tibetan monks and that sort of stuff to balance out the the left brain analytical sort of with the spiritual mind and the right mind, the creative side. And someone introduced me to cryptocurrency. It was a friend of mine who was a financial planner back in 2012. And he said, oh, you've got to get into this. It's this new digital currency. It runs the internet and all this sort of stuff. And I think Bitcoin was about 60 cents or a dollar at the time, you know. And I looked at it and said, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand it. To me, it was just like you play games and you get points like in Pac-Man. I didn't really understand what it was about. He was absolutely passionate about it. He was selling everything and, and buying Bitcoin. He even actually put his house up for sale um, to try and buy more Bitcoin and ended up writing a book about Bitcoin. And I just like ignored Bitcoin, ignored Bitcoin because um, I didn't understand it. And then a few years later, um, I was talking to one of my other friends and saying, you know, we've got staff in Africa, we've got staff in Indonesia, we've got staff in India, all over the place. And some people like to, to send money to a first world country might cost you $30 in a bank transfer. But in some of these developing economies where the people might not necessarily have a bank account, you have to send cash to the Western Union. They have to go there with their passport and they pick up the cash from the Western Union office. And it was costing like 60 or $70 to send $1,000 to Africa or Indonesia. And this is my other friend said, oh, you just use Bitcoin. And I'm like, yeah, I've heard of Bitcoin. He's like, yeah, it's just like emailing money to people and they can get it at the other side and then they can meet someone on the street and someone on the street gives them money and they transfer the Bitcoin from their phone. And I went, okay, how much does this thing cost? And he's like, oh, it costs you about 50 cents to transfer $1,000. And I was like, well, it's way cheaper than Western Union. It's way cheaper than PayPal and bank transfers and things like that. So we started buying Bitcoin so that we could pay our staff in other countries. And so this was, what, 2015 when Bitcoin was under $1,000. And we were just buying you know, boatloads of Bitcoin so we could send off to people um, and then saving up some so we've got some for next month that we can send out. And didn't really see it as a store of value. I didn't understand that Bitcoin was a, a limited and scarce resource like gold. And then my friend who'd introduced me to Bitcoin said, oh, there's this new thing coming out. It's called Ethereum. And not only is Ethereum money that you can email to people, but it's also smart contracts and legal contracts and, and bills of sale and this sort of stuff. And I was like, oh, what else is there? He's like, oh, there's this IOTA thing and there's this power ledger thing where you can send solar panels power to people. And I'm like, this is just like a little tiny stock market. I understand the stock market. That's where I cut my teeth. I've had years and years experience in the stock market. So when I started researching into some of these projects, as many of the listeners know, there's a lot of rubbish. There's a lot of scams. There's a lot of rug pulls, pump and dumps, you know, meme coins and this sort of stuff. But by using a simple checklist of going through and researching each project as if it's a stock, we were able to pick the best ones. So in seven years of my own personal trading and, and running the, the Boston Coin portfolio, we've never had a rug pull. We've never had a scam. We've never had any of these things in thousands and thousands of different trades. And you know, by using the four-point checklist, We've managed to get some coins when they were very cheap, when they were first released, before other people discovered them, how good they were. So we've made gains of 10,000%, 13,000% or more on like six separate occasions inside the portfolio because we actually do our homework. And it's a very simple process. As I say, it's a four-step process. And we teach that to people. If you want to learn how to do it yourself, we'll teach you how to do it yourself. Um, otherwise, obviously, you know, we've got a, a for-profit business and we can do it for you. Amazing, really nice story. So um, 
this definitely relates to my next question because I know that you are co-founder of the crypto fund Boston Trading. So can you tell us more about it and what was actually the reason to start it? Because I discovered the, the crypto market and thought, okay, this is a little stock market. I can actually put some money in there. And you know, as, as you know, with the stock market, if there's a major crash, if the stock market drops by 10 or 20%, the governing bodies can stop trading. They just stop it and say, okay, we're going to we've calmed down. You know, there's been a plane crash, but we're going to just stop the market panic. Or if the market's going up too far, too fast, if the market's gone up by 50% in a day, then they can actually stop trading. But with crypto, there's no regulations. There's no governing body. And so sometimes, you know, you can lose 50% in a day. You can lose 90% in a day. But if you know what you're doing, you can also make three or 400% in a day or sometimes 1,000% in a month. So I was doing it myself and going, this is great because, number one, I know what I'm doing. I'm following the formula and I'm having much more wins than I'm having losses. And when I was talking to my friends who are still financial planners and lawyers and stockbrokers and that kind of stuff, they say, hey, what are you doing these days? I say, oh, well, I meditate a lot and sometimes I invest into this crypto thing. You know, I might spend an hour a day on crypto. Um, and I've been making like thousands of percent gains. And in the stock market, I might be lucky to make 20% to 60% in a year. But in crypto, I could make that in a day. And so one of, one of my friends was like, oh, can you teach me how to do that? I said, sure, here's, here's the four-step protocol. And then one of my financial planners like, oh, can you teach me? I can now teach the lawyer. So I was teaching people, giving away this information. And then within a couple of months, they'd come back to me and say, it's great. I know how to do it. I've been doing it, but I'm too busy. My business, my family takes up too much of my life. Can you do it for me? And I was like, oh, I don't really want to because I'm just enjoying playing my own thing. I'll, I'll show you how to do it. But eventually the pressure from people saying, can you do it for me? Can you do it for me? I went, okay, look, I only want to do it if I can actually do it legally and responsibly and ethically and make a mutual fund. It's not just, oh, yeah, someone gives me five grand, someone gives me 10 grand and, you know, did I lose it? Did I, did I make money? Who knows? So, and there was no crypto mutual funds in existence. So we just sort of looked at, okay, Vanguard's like the number one uh, stock mutual fund. We'll just copy basically what Vanguard does. We'll have a look at how they've set up their legal structures. We'll have a look at what they charge and that sort of stuff. So we basically just modeled it off a stock mutual fund, launched this thing, and then just sort of watched it and said, okay, how's it going to go for the first couple of years when there was only six of us in the, in the fund? before we launched it to the public because we wanted to make sure it was actually good before we got anybody else involved. So that in the start, there was just like a couple of financial planners, a couple of lawyers and the accountant. And after two years of outperforming Bitcoin and doing very well, we went, okay, we're going to launch it to the public. And we've been running this fund and running this fund and running this fund. And then we're like three years down the track. Vanguard hasn't launched a crypto fund. BlackRock hasn't launched a crypto fund. Fidelity, none of these guys like JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, no one's launched a crypto fund in the three years that we've been running. What's going on? Maybe they think it's a scam. Maybe they don't know how to do it. I don't know. Are we silly? Because when you turn up at the party and there's no one else there, you start to think to yourself, am I five minutes early or am I in the wrong place? And I was starting to think maybe we're in the wrong place, even though we were making lots of money and helping lots of people. No one else was coming on board. And it was probably cheapest, like 2018. So we'd, we'd been going for like three or four years at this stage before another crypto fund launched. And so we had competitors, like someone launched a crypto fund in Singapore. And we go, beauty, now there's someone else that so we can actually compare ourselves to someone else rather than thinking we're great because we're the only one. Um, now we can actually look to, to the competition. And obviously, with different stock mutual funds, you can compare the vanguards to the JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and, and that sort of stuff. So it's, it's good for us if we have more and more competitors coming into the marketplace that actually encourages us to, to test ourselves against them and try and get a little bit better. Yeah, that's great. And I have seen that you actually have three options in the fund. Boston coin, Polycoin, and Dart coin. So can you explain what's the difference between these three? Yeah, I guess for a lot of people, you know, they, they might not think they have a mutual fund, but usually it's like a retirement account, depending on which country you're in. A retirement account, a Roth IRA, a 401k, superannuation fund, whatever. So your boss is putting away some money on your behalf. 
And the default thing that they put you into if you don't choose anything is what's called a balanced fund. And it's normally like I've got a little bit of stocks in there and it's got a little bit of property and bonds in case the stocks go down and the property and bonds go up and it tends to balance each other out. So that's the first fund that we created was a conservative one that was designed to meet most people's needs most of the time. And even though it was conservative for cryptocurrency, uh, yeah, we, we still made like five or 600% in the first year. And we, we invest into infrastructure because some people will remember being on MySpace, you know, 10 or 15 years ago or carrying a Nokia mobile phone 10 or 15 years ago. And we thought MySpace was great. We thought Nokia was great. And then Facebook comes out and destroys MySpace. And Apple phones come out and destroy Nokia. And no one carries a Nokia anymore. So we were thinking at the time, what happens if Bitcoin goes to zero? What happens if someone brings out a better than Bitcoin Bitcoin? Um, we think, okay, people are going to go to the exchanges and they're going to need to sell their Bitcoin to buy the new thing. And the exchanges make money whether the market's going up or down. And also buying into the infrastructure like the, uh, the fiber optic cables because the internet all runs on fiber optic cables. Your streaming service runs on fiber optic cables. And of course, all cryptocurrency does as well. And it's like a little toll road, all these cars zipping along the toll road. And the more traffic, the more money you make. So we invested into those things just in case Bitcoin was going to crash or something was going to come out that was better than Bitcoin. So it was a balanced fund and it worked out well for us because during the pandemic, of course, stock market crashed, everything went down. But the exchanges made money because more people were at home and they were trading. And of course, the professionals like the doctors and the lawyers and the, you know, the accountants were working from home doing Zoom calls, which increased the fiber optic traffic. And the hospitality workers who couldn't work in the restaurants and cafes, they were sitting at home watching Netflix, which increased the traffic on the fiber optic network. So when everything was going down at the start of the pandemic, our portfolio actually went up by 50%. So it's kind of a balanced middle of the road fund that suits most people most of the time. But then we had some people coming to us and saying, I want something more risky because I've heard my cousin made 10,000% on Dogecoin or something like that. So we, we don't really advertise this one. We don't really tell people about the dark coin because if you tell people that you've got a fund that did 9,000% in its first year, then people go, oh, it's a scam. It sounds too good to be true. It's got to be rubbish, right? So we don't advertise that one. But people who are already in the Boston coin portfolio and they've seen how we make 500%, 600%, 1,000%, 4,000%, 4, they kind of get it. And if they want to take a little bit of extra risk, then they can go into the high risk fund. And again, you know, 9,000% in the first year and then, you know, drop by half in the second year. It's still pretty good average. <laughs> it's still, still many times your money. It's a lot of volatility for people who aren't used to volatility. And for people with shorter term needs, so saying, okay, you know, I'm in my 70s or 80s, I'm retired, I don't want to see my money going up and down. <laughs> I just want to have something that's slow and steady, like a, a, a bank term deposit where I can make 4 or 5% a year. Or someone who's saving up for a house or saving up for a car and they want the money back in two years, they don't want their money going up 1,000% and then down minus 60%. So we invented the Polycoin just to make a slow and steady, boring little thing that you can invest into for one or two years and just make four or five percent without too many ups and downs. Because obviously, as you know, Paul, going into the bank, you don't even make one percent anymore. So that's why we've got that one. Like it like an old old certificate of deposit, term deposit. But now we've got the like the small, medium, and large, the low risk, the medium risk, and the and the high risk. And obviously the returns have been, you know, like five percent, you know, a couple of hundred percent and a couple of thousand percent, depending on what people are actually wanting to do. Realize honestly, I haven't heard about another fund doing something like that, and I'm sure that our listeners will be really excited about this option because we all have our life, our businesses, and sometimes uh, it's hard to find time to make a proper research on different projects so you can have a higher chance of increasing your investment portfolio. So this sounds like a very good option for very busy people. But I suppose everybody who is interested in this will have a very important question, which is what are the minimums for each of these funds and options? Yeah, good question. When we first started out, our minimum was only $1,000 because we wanted it to be available for everyone and keep it very, very simple. 
And again, that's what they do with a lot of the stock mutual funds and things like that. So that's that's where we stood for like, you know, four years, we had the minimum of $1,000. And then we, we had a few more people coming in and saying, I want to invest on behalf of my superannuation or my 401k or that sort of stuff, which meant that we needed to jump through a few more hoops. We needed to set up other structures so that people could invest into stocks in the company and the stocks actually buy the, buy the crypto because a lot of the, the retirement funds around were created before cryptocurrency existed. So if you've got your, you know, your SMA or your 401k or whatever, it'll say inside the constitution document, you're allowed to buy domestic shares, international shares, um, stocks, property, bonds, cash. That's about it. But you're not allowed to buy crypto because crypto wasn't invented. So without going back and incurring legal costs of changing all the documents, we created a workaround where your retirement fund could actually buy stocks in another company that we set up in the US. And you buy stocks in that company or your corporate structure buys stocks in that company, that company turns around and then buys the crypto on your behalf and holds it on your behalf. So that made it a lot more simple for more people to get into. But when we did the math, obviously having these extra layers of of protection and things like that, we were actually losing money. Every time someone sent us $1,000, we were losing money. And I didn't want to increase the fees. So all we did is said, okay, for individuals, it's now $10,000. For their first investment, after that, they can throw in $1,000 a month or something because the, the initial setup is the hard part. And for the corporate structures like the 401ks and the retirement funds and the you know, family trusts and that sort of stuff, the minimum is 50000 because there's, there's a big expense, obviously, for us to set up an account. Once it's set up and running, it's, it's fairly easy. Now, even that, I mean, it sounds like a big onus on us because it went from $1,000 up to $10,000. But the other funds that are around, and you probably know some of them, so I won't, I won't mention their names, but there's two funds in Singapore. And these guys have a minimum of $100,000 US for anyone, just for an individual. And I mean, if you're an average investor, 100000 might be all of your funds. And let me be the first to say you shouldn't put all of your money into crypto, right? It's, it's always about diversification. So you should have a little bit in crypto, a little bit in gold, silver, you know, a little bit in property, a little bit in stocks. Because obviously things will happen and when one, one market crashes, the other one is actually going to be okay. So by, by saying if you've got $100,000 and you stick it all in crypto, that's, that's just crazy. 10 grand in crypto and 10 grand in stocks and the other things is, is fine. There's other funds out there that are opening up now and they're saying, you know, the minimum investment is two and a half million. And we're like, whoa, they're really not catering for the average person on the street because most financial advisors will say, you know, put 5 to 10% of your net wealth in crypto. Not all of it, because that's obviously very risky and you should be diversified in other asset classes. So you imagine if, if 10% of your net wealth is 25 million, <laughs> you're not an average investor. <laughs> so that's a very long answer to a short question. We're trying to make it simple for most people. And again, the, the four-step protocol that we use for choosing our, our investments, we give that away for free to people. So if you're listening to this and you've only got $2,000 or $3,000 or $150, we'll actually show you how to invest that using the same methodology that we've been using for seven years. Um, The same checklist that we use is also used by a billion dollar hedge fund in the UK. I know they've been copying it because I look at their work and yeah, we will teach you how to do it. And that's fine if you've got the time to do it yourself. And yeah, maybe if you're young and you're single, you have plenty of time to do your own investing and do your own investing. That's fine. That's a great way to learn. But then 10 years down the track, when you've got a mortgage and, and a partner and kids and your, your work's taking up a lot of your time, then you might want to hire someone to look after it for you. And that's okay. Horses for courses. Yeah, absolutely. Different ages, different opportunities, different options. So you are saying that, let's say, I'm putting 10K to start and next month I have some money that I want to also put in the fund. Do I have to put another 10K or it can be another amount like, for example, lower amount? Yeah, so 10,000 is just to kick it off because obviously there's there's setup costs that we have to face, uh, particularly as we're going forward with new legislation on the um, know your customer ruling, the anti-money laundering, counter-terrorism, all that sort of jazz. So for, for those who aren't aware, like the, the US, the UK, Canada and Australia, have got draft legislation in place for cryptocurrency. So it's going to be run like the stock market. Now, that draft legislation is due to come in December 
January. So maybe January 2023, the legislation is going to be there. We've been doing it anyway in our fund. We've been doing it for the last seven years because we knew the legislation was going to come in sooner or later. Um, and we may as well start doing it now before we have to. That way it's easier to go ahead. So, yeah, the setup cost is is harder for us. So you drop in $10,000 now, that's fine. But then next month you might drop in a 1000 another 1000 the next month. That's okay too. It's strip feeding, dollar cost averaging, whatever you want to call it. But it's obviously a lot easier for us because we're not starting up a new investor. We're not starting up a new wallet or anything like that for you. And first of all, that's great. And if I want, for example, to get some of the money out of my account, is this possible or I have to wait for a specific amount of time to have gone in order to be able to do that? I'm always a little bit scared of those companies that say, you know, if you want your money back, you have to give us 60 days notice. And you're like, where are you putting my money? What are you doing with it? <laughs> like, is, is it locked up in a futures contract or something like that? So, I mean, the, the more you know about finance, the more that should scare you because you get into like futures contracts and long contracts and, and option swaps and things like that and go, yeah, no, that's crazy. The, the regulation stock market thing has always been T plus three. So you sell your Woolworths or your Tesla or your, your whatever, you know, Microsoft stock today, you should have the money in your bank account within three days. So that's, that's the model we've been using. The fund is liquid. It's not locked up. We're not doing anything weird with your money. So if you call up on Monday and want your money, it's usually in your bank account by Tuesday or Wednesday. You know, it's cryptocurrency. It's not complicated. It's not rocket science. Um, so, yeah, some, sometimes, you know, people like we, we've had one of our investors who was one of our early investors and she was in for oh, like from day one for about three or four years. And she rang me up and she said, look, I'm, I'm splitting up with my husband. I want to take my investment out. But if you put it in my bank account, he's going to see the money. He's going to want half of the money. So can you can you transfer it to a Bitcoin wallet and I can link up the Bitcoin wallet to a Visa card and then he'll never see it and I can just go shopping? But sure, we can do that for you. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's plenty of different options. But, yeah, realistically, you know, it, it should be only two or three days because – um, unlike banking, like banks are closed on the weekend, banks are closed on public holiday and the stock market's closed on public holiday. But crypto is running 24-7 around the world. There's no public holidays. There's no weekends in the crypto market. So if any, if any of these funds saying they can't give you money back within you know seven days or 60 days or whatever, it's like, don't deal with them. They're doing something weird. Yeah, exactly. Because I have heard some of my friends complaining that they have to wait for months to get their money back. That's why I was really curious to find out the answer of this question. So I'm really happy that it's not the case in your fund. So I think it's a great opportunity to be part of such fund. And I'm sure that it's even greater opportunity for you to be a co-founder of such fund because you have had the chance to see also a lot of different things regarding the crypto market, how things are happening there. So I'm sure that you have also had the chance to learn some more things about crypto. And because of that, I'm really curious to find out what are the three most important lessons that you have learned as an owner of a crypto investment fund? Um, crikey. Probably as an investor, I've learned a lot of valuable investments, whether it's in crypto, whether it's in property, whether it's in, in stocks and shares. And the, the first lesson is I'll say you'll never be 100% ready. You'll never be ready. You've just got to get to the stage where you go, I know enough. And it's still a little bit scary. Like the first time you do anything, the first time you start a new business, the first time you start a new relationship even, um, you know, you go on a couple of dates with this person and then think, oh, I don't know whether I want to spend the rest of my life with them, but maybe I'll commit to going away for the weekend or something like that. So you've, you've got to just go, you know what, I know enough that I can put some money in and don't make it earth-changing money. Again, like you don't put your entire life savings into one project because things can happen. Things can go bad. You might not be able to get your money back for 60 days or maybe that project's going to go downhill for a while. I mean, even people who invested in Netflix, you know, because it was the pandemic, everybody was staying home, everyone was watching Netflix. But if you bought Netflix stock last year, right now you're sitting on a 75% loss, right? If you bought Facebook last year, right now you're sitting on a 56% loss. 
So you don't put your life savings into the one thing, but you've got to invest in something. Because even though Netflix is down 75%, if you got in three or four or five years ago, then you're up thousands and thousands of percent. So you've got to start, you'll never feel 100% ready, but you've got to start and you've got to do something. So if you, you know, five years ago, if you'd invested into Netflix and Bitcoin and I don't know, PayPal and, and that sort of stuff, you find one will go up, one will go down, but over time you're thousands and thousands of percent up. And even after a crash, you're still going to be okay. So there's always going to be that little feeling in the back of your head, what if I invest and it crashes? Well, what if you don't invest and it doesn't crash? What if all of your friends have made 10,000% and you are the one who's still sitting there with your $500 and your $500 is not even worth $500 anymore because the government keeps printing currency and now your money's worthless, you know? So take the leap, but ensure you're diversified and ensure you do it safely. So, because you've got to feed yourself. You know, you don't put all your money into something because Murphy's Law will tell you the day after you invest, the fridge might break down or the car needs a new tyre or the cat gets sick or something like that. So you've got to have a little bit of money up your sleeve so that the investment can do what the investment does. It'll go up, it'll go down, it'll go up, it'll go down. But over time, it should be heading up. And I think it's, it's a personal psychology thing. Like a lot of people are scared to invest because they don't know enough about it. And you'll never know everything. I've been in the field for 30 years and I don't know everything, but I know enough. And once I've got that, you know, that four point checklist for the crypto or a nine point checklist for the stocks, I go, I'm about 80% sure that this is gonna be okay. And that's about as sure as you can be because none of us have crystal balls. None of us know the future. And if you think I'm about 80% confident about this new date that I've gone on is gonna be the one, jump in, you know? Amazing, amazing. Yeah, so you have mentioned a few times that it's really important to do diversification of your investment portfolio. So what you have found as the best diversification strategy in crypto investing, for example? I, I think Boston Coin's pretty good as, as far as diversification goes, because again, we've bought into the exchanges, um, not just the projects, because you know Bitcoin has been number one for the last 14 years. But so was MySpace, so was Nokia, so was Netscape Navigator. When, the in, when I got five first got on the internet in 1995, 1996, Netscape Navigator had 80% of the market. And then a few years later, like Internet Explorer took over the market. And then a few years down the track now, and Google Chrome is 80% of the market. So I think you have to be aware of, of what's going on. Um, but yeah, diversification and continuing to adjust things as we go. Like I said before, like we've, we've had six of our projects that have made more than 10,000%. And when, when something is 2% of your portfolio, if you lose that 2%, it doesn't matter, really. You're, you're still okay. But when that 2% suddenly becomes 30% of your portfolio, you start to think, oh my God, what if that company went broke? I'm gonna lose a big chunk of my money. So that's where we adjust the portfolio and say, okay, we'll take profits on some of that. We might sell off half of that and redistribute it into the other more reliable things, but always keeping your finger on the pulse because no one wants to wake up one day and find out that, you know, all of the blockbuster video stores have closed down and Kodak's gone broke and that's where your investment was. So, <laughs> yeah. Diversification is more than important these days. Mm. Like you said, companies appear and disappear in a matter of uh, months, years, like in crypto is even weeks. So yes, <laughs> you have to be familiar that it's very possible to lose everything in one day if you have put, of course, all your eggs in, in one basket. But at the same time, if you know how to diversificate, you can have a steadily increasing percent during the year so yeah diversif diversification especially in crypto is is very very important so i suppose this is one of the very common mistakes that people do that they trust one project and put all their money in this project because they really like the concept of this project or they have heard that it's possible to make thousands and thousands of percentages of this project that's why they're going to put all their funds so they can become millionaires overnight but this <laughs> really is the case so this is one of the mistakes that most of the beginner investors in crypto are doing 
But what are the other most common mistakes that you have seen people are doing in crypto investing? Um, probably time to introduce the four-step protocol. So this is the one that's protected us from all the scams and the rug pulls and also identified some of the best projects. So we just use, it's, it's again, four steps. We use the acronym COIN, C-O-I-N, and C stands for the C-suite, like the CEO, the CFO, the CAO of the company. And there's a lot of people out there who are investing into like Squid Game coin or Dogecoin or something like that. Like, But who actually founded that? What's their experience? What's their background? Are they a real person? Because Cointelegraph said in 2018 that 90% of the cryptocurrencies were scams. And if you look on their websites and their white papers, which is what we do all day, every day, you find there's stock images of people who are just supermodels and or you know people who don't even really exist, or there's no listing of the founders at all. Now, why would I invest in this project? Would you invest in a company that's run by someone that you've never even heard of and you don't know what their background is? You can't check them out on LinkedIn or on social medias or anything like that. So that's one of the big ones is people see something on YouTube or Elon Musk said something about it or my friend's cousin invested into it and they've already made 300% and it's going to the moon. It's going to make 10,000%. Like, okay, but who's behind this project? What's their experience? What's their background? Have they run similar businesses? So, yeah, number one is always look into the founders or the C-suite. The second point on the checklist is O for offering. So what does this project actually do? Like there was a project a few years ago that's like, oh, we're going to put fruit on the blockchain. And, you know, we're going to have this fruit coin and it's going to have fruit on the blockchain. It's going to be great. I'm like, yeah, but how does that solve any problems? What does that do to help me? It doesn't. All right? That was the simple answer. And that one was a scam and it took people's money and they all ran away. Whereas one of the ones that we invested into you know, seven years ago was Power Ledger. And it was started by a couple of guys sitting in Perth saying, you know, like they've got solar panels all over their roof. And that was fine when their kids lived at home. But once the kids moved out, they're generating a lot more power than what they could actually use. And when they sent the power back to the grid and the, the electricity company was buying it, they only got 10 cents per unit. But when they were using electricity, they had to pay the company 30 cents per unit. And they're like, this is wrong. You know, we're paying 30 cents, we're only getting 10 cents. Wouldn't it be great if I could share the solar power with my neighbor? I could sell the solar power to my neighbor for 15 cents and I'm happy because I'm getting 50% more and the neighbor's happy because he's buying it for half the price. And as it turned out, you know, the electricity grid, all the houses are connected. The internet, everything's connected. So the offering was, why don't we create this kind of eBay peer-to-peer -peer sort of system where we can share solar power with each other? Great offering. You know, whether it's that's a cryptocurrency or whether that's a business, you'd look at that and you go, yep, I'll invest in that. And one of their first investors in these two little guys from Perth was Richard Branson because he's got solar panels all over Necker Island and he loves the sustainable solar panel. Richard Branson's investing in it. So happy days. It's a great solution and it's been going for years and years and years and still solving problems. Um, so that actually, funnily enough, that brings us to the third COI. I stands for investors. Who else is investing into this project? Because we got into Power Ledger after Branson had invested into it. And Richard Branson, he's, he's a smart cookie. You know, he's, he's been around for a long, long time. He's an older bloke. He's got a lot of money and he's still got a smile on his face. He's not stressed. If he's investing into it, obviously he's got teams and teams of people who have done their due diligence and done their homework because he's not a silly bloke. And we want to look at who else is investing into it and what sort of people they are. Because if you're here about a project and you don't know the founders, you don't understand the offering, you don't understand what problem they're solving and the investors are just a whole bunch of guys on YouTube and they like it because it's called I Love Boobs Coin or it's called Squid Game Coin or something silly, those investors are all idiots, right? And they think they're going to get rich, but really the, the person who started this thing is going to take all their money. So you want to look at, make sure the investors who are putting their money into it are actually smart people. And then obviously, once you've invested into something and you've done your research into it, down the track somewhere, you're going to want to be able to sell that thing. And this is what you were talking about before, Paul, about getting your money out. Right. So the final step, step N, is for network. Because if you've just invested into this thing and then it's gone up a thousand percent and you go, okay, now I want to take my money out and, and buy my Lamborghini, there needs to be a big network of buyers. 
So you have a look for the project, check out their social, their Discord, their Slack, their, their Telegram channel, their Twitter, their Facebook, whatever, because when you want to sell, there's got to be a lot of buyers. I, I looked at a project yesterday and they had 16 followers on Twitter. Now, this project said, oh, yeah, we've been around for five years and we're like number one in, in you know, Bucharest or Belarus or someone like that. I'm like, you got 16 followers on Twitter. So if I invest with you, I'll be number 17. <laughs> and then when I want to sell, there's only going to be 16 other people who are actually buying. So it's a no from me. So that's the biggest mistake. It's very easy. You know, C-O-I-N, check the C-suite, check the offering, check the investors, check the network. And if you do it well, it takes five minutes to check out one project. And this is the problem. Most people, they just see a coin they like the name of. And Squid Game Coin is a perfect example because they saw it on Netflix and went, oh, yeah, I'm going to buy this. They didn't look into it and those people lost all their money. It takes you takes you a long time. I don't, I don't know how much money you make in an hour, but it might take you a lot of hours to make a thousand bucks. And it'll take you about 60 seconds to lose that money because you didn't say, I'm going to take five minutes first. It's going to take five minutes to protect my money. You know, easy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What you are saying sounds very easy, but at the same time, we shouldn't forget that like we are humans and we tend to be lazy. So uh, <laughs> even if you have to do five minutes, like why you would do this five minutes when you can watch five minutes more of Netflix or five minutes spent doing nothing or something like that. <laughs> so uh, I suppose that there are also other ways to reduce the chances of becoming part of another rug pool or something like that. But like I said, we are lazy and we prefer to hope that what people are saying is true than making the research ourselves. So um, what you're suggesting as a method uh, is something that I'm hearing for the first time and it sounds like a very great and easy strategy, like I said, for uh, doing your first research on a project. Maybe uh, if you want to invest in the long term, you have to go deeper in the white paper, for example, on the history of the CEOs yeah. and also of the history of the investors. But as a starting point, I think your method is really great. So I definitely suggest our listeners to, to release on this part and start using your method when they're making their first uh, decision if they're going to invest in something or not. So what you're saying is... Not, not everyone's lazy though, Paul. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> some people, yeah, legit lazy. They just want to do the bare minimum work and, and make millions of dollars. But for, for other people and for a lot of our investors, it's like, you know, I'm a dentist. I'm very busy at work and I've got kids and I've got, you know, soccer practice and I've got this and that. So, yeah, they legitimately don't have time to spend five minutes checking out every project. And when you consider there's 20,000 different projects on the crypto market, that's a lot of five minutes to do that. Uh, which is which is why we exist, you know, not because people are lazy, but because people are busy. And our, our first investors were, you know, accountants, lawyers, dentists, doctors, yeah, financial planners, because they're so busy out at work making money, they don't want to actually do that sort of stuff when they come home. No? Okay, that's fine. We'll do it for you. You just got to pay us. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I'm not saying that everyone is lazy, but at the same time, you can probably agree with me that most of the young people are lazy. They don't have this busy life that you're just saying. And they're like currently in yeah. the crypto. Most of the investors are probably young people from what we have heard from the statistics. So I'm talking about mm -hmm. that when we are talking about like grownups, like adults, <laughs> absolutely like We are all busy with our personal life, with everything. Yeah. But we know that right now crypto is mainly young people. So that's why I'm saying that like this lazy thing is why there are so many rug pulls and so many people complaining that they have been part of a rug pull. Yeah. So what you're saying is great. But at the same time, we both know that right now it's a little bit more complicated market to invest. So. What do you would advise beginners to do at the moment if they are interested in crypto investing? It really depends on where they are. So, you know, there's some people who want to get in, but they're not sure how. And obviously, like a mutual fund, whether it's stock mutual fund or crypto mutual fund, that's a great way to get started. Like when I first started investing, I used mutual funds because I didn't know how to do it myself. 
And after I'd started using mutual funds for a while, I started to read the reports and I started to understand why they were doing things. And the average person can understand Coca-Cola shares go up in summer because everyone's drinking fizzy water and Coca-Cola shares go down in winter because people are drinking less fizzy water. So you can understand those sort of seasonal things and you start to understand different industries occur at different times and things like that. So getting started, again, you start with a mutual fund if that's the way you want to go. Otherwise, there's plenty of courses and training and, and trading that you can do out there. Out of the thousands and thousands of different people on YouTube, there's actually three that I would listen to, literally three out of thousands, because I know these guys personally, and I know they actually walk their talk. I know how much money they make from trading. I know how much money they're making from selling courses and things on YouTube. Whereas most of the people who are giving away the advice are actually just full of it. You know, they, they lease a Mercedes for the day or they lease a Lamborghini, take a photo of themselves in front of it, and they don't actually make any money on trading. They make money from selling people courses and things like that. So getting started, just be wary that about 90% of the stuff that you'll hear is lies. Obviously, you can look at like the top five or the top 10 on coin market cap. Same as if you invested in, in the top 10 stocks, even, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, you're going to be okay. There are companies who do go broke and I've obviously, you know, Badmouth, Kodak and, and MySpace and these sort of guys. But if you're diversifying into 10 different ones, if one or two go broke, the other ones tend to do a lot better because all the people who used to be with MySpace now go on to Facebook. All the people who used to go to Blockbuster Video now sign up with Netflix or Disney Plus or whatever. So diversifying like that, there's a lot of little tiny apps that you can get for your phone where you can put in like a dollar a day or $2 a day. You know, I've got one that I've been putting in $10 a day for several years. And if the market's going up, it buys less, obviously, because the price is higher. If the market's going down, then you're actually buying more because the price is lower. But it's just getting into that discipline of saving a little bit all the time and investing, you know, because again, it's good to do your homework, but the worst mistake you'll ever make is doing too much homework and you get what we call analysis paralysis. You start reading and researching all this stuff, but you never actually take any action. And then three years later, you go, geez, I wish I had bought that thing when all my friends did. So start simple, start small, do something. Even if it's only, you know, 2 or $3 a day, that's what you spend on, on coffee or something like that. You can get a lot of these little apps where you can just start putting a couple of dollars into the, you know, the top five or the top ten. That's enough to get started and then check back on it. You know, don't, don't look at it every day, but check back on it in six months. Check back on it in 12 months and see how much you've got. Really nice, really nice. So I think that we have talked a lot about how people can do better investing, but I just can hold myself and ask you the question that I ask every guest that we have on our podcast, which is how do you think a person can do more investing rather than gambling in crypto? I guess if you've seen enough movies, they, they say like on The Simpsons and, and The Hangover and things like that, it's only gambling if you don't know what you're doing. Right? I mean, obviously, going into the casino is gambling and the house has always got the odds rigged in their favour. But in investment markets, you know, whether it be property, bonds, stocks, shares, crypto, whatever, if you don't know what you're doing, it's basically gambling. You may as well be throwing a dart at the wall. And there's plenty of people out there and, you know, it's like, oh, my friend's cousin made 50,000% on Dogecoin or Shiba Inu coin or Squid Game coin or whatever. Like... Cool. Anybody can get lucky once, but show me the person who's done it three times. Show me the person who's done it four times. You know, I can show you my records. I've done it six times just in our fund, right? Because we actually know what we're doing. We've got, you know, 14 years of crypto history, which is not very long, but behind that is 20, 30 years in the stock market. And behind that, is you can tell what the stock market did over the last 400 years, right? Because you can actually get charts of, you know, what the Dutch East India Company did when there was a war on, you know, how BHP went when there was a Great Depression and things like that. So when you start to see what's going on in the world, you say, okay, this is what happened to stocks and shares and property the last time we had a war. This is what happened to stocks and shares and property the last time we had low interest rates or high interest rates. So learning a few of those tricks 
can be helpful, but otherwise, yeah, you, you've got to rely on the experts. And there's very few people who can actually prove and show and demonstrate what they've done over time. A lot of people can make claims, but it's it's up to you to find out who can back it up. So, you know, anybody wants to check me out, go nuts. Google my name, find out the book I wrote two years before the GFC that was predicting a massive stock market crash and property market crash. I'm happy to stand on my record and say, yeah, I've done things, you know, I'm okay. Yeah, you're absolutely right. These days, everyone is an expert and influencer. Like you can just put graphics that you have stolen from somewhere like showing how great of a trader you are. And after that, you are the best expert in the crypto industry. So these days, it's very easy to, to fake it because, you know, it's very popular belief that you have to fake it till you make it. So I have seen this uh, during all my more than 14 years of marketing many, many people and experts, especially doing that. And in the end, like they don't even make it, they just fake it. Mm. But I suppose it's normal. It's a new industry. And it's understandable that a lot of people will try to get advantage of others because of that. Um, Yeah, it's part of the evolution of every type of uh, industry, I believe. So we are close to one hour in the podcast, which is amazing. And I'm very, very happy. And um, again, uh, honored to have you here. But I suppose people won't have enough time to listen everything that you have to share. To <laughs> listen yeah. on fast forward. Listen, listen while you're doing the laundry or the shopping or something. Exactly. <laughs> so um, are there any final words that um, you want to, to share with our listeners? Yeah, I mean, if anybody wants to find out more, we literally started a not-for-profit organization before we started the business, giving away the information for free because wanting to share it so that other people didn't lose their money in crypto. We wanted to share it so other people can make money in the stock market and crypto. So if anybody wants to to go and find out how to do it for themselves, not-for-profit organization, we we update new articles and, and new projects, new crypto projects every couple of weeks at Krillionaire.com. So that's C-R-Y as in crypto. And then the last bit of millionaire. At Krillionaire.com, we give away a lot of free information. And it's been updated every couple of weeks for the last five or six years. And then if you want to get a copy of my stock market book for free, instead of paying $30 on Amazon, go to bostontrading.co, sign up for the newsletter. And every month we send out a newsletter which basically says, here's what's going on in the world with interest rates and governments and and wars and famines and things like that. Here's how that affects the stock market. Here's how that affects the crypto market. So you can read the newsletter for free. You can even go back and see where we actually predicted the 2020 crash uh, because we've got the last five or six years of newsletters on the website. So you can see what we're investing into depending on what season it was. And you'll, you'll learn along the way. You'll learn a bit more about how markets work, about the stock market, about the crypto market. And obviously, if you want us to give, give us your money, we're happy to take your money. But if you just want to take the knowledge and use it, we're happy to share that with you. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, all the resources that you just mentioned, we're going to put them on the show notes. So if people are interested to find out more about your mutual fund, about your educational nonprofit organization, they'll have this opportunity. So Jeremy, uh, I want to say a big thank you again for being a guest on the podcast. It was an amazing show, I think. I can't believe it's been an hour. It feels like we've just been chatting for 10 minutes. Yeah. It's been awesome. Absolutely. And I feel sorry to everyone because they can't see your amazing dogs that I can see right now. They are like (laughs) really, really nice and cute. But anyway, thank you very much again. And thank you very much to all of our listeners that have been part of our journey, part of all of our episodes. I'm really grateful for your support. So If you want to enjoy all that's coming, please subscribe to your favorite platform. And yeah, I'm Power, the CMO of Seasonal Tokens, and I'll talk to you on the next episode. Bye.